Are you conscious? Oh, well, why are you laughing? Okay, hands up if you're conscious now. Right, hands down. Who didn't put their hand up? Come on, come on. Who didn't put their hand up? Why not? Good. Excellent. Better than all those hands that went up. Who else didn't? Who else didn't put their hand up? Well, I expected a psychedelic type. Com oh, yes, you. I really expected better of you. They're the ones that only turn Okay, we've started. Are you conscious now? Good. Did anyone get this strange experience of thinking, well, of course I'm conscious now, but hang on a minute. She made me conscious by asking the question. Yeah, I can see a few nods and yeah. That just is a weird thing. Hang on to that. Think about that. Find it in your life. If you're a meditator, you'll have that sensation of becoming mindful. Well, what was it like before? If you don't know and you're not sure, who does? We haven't got a consciousness meter that can look in your head. Brain scans won't tell you. Nobody else can know. And if you don't know, so good for you, the guys who had some uncertainty, and may there be more of you. So uh, let us begin. Um, are you conscious now? Well, okay. You may get the impression that you know what consciousness is. We all know what consciousness is, don't we? Okay, good. I'm beginning to sow some doubt. My uh, big consciousness textbook, which I've just finished the fourth edition with my daughter, it begins with perplexity and it ends with perplexity because that's what we should have in the 21st century, well, now, when we really don't have a clue. Well, we have a few clues, but we don't have answers to the difficult questions. So, slight recap for anyone who doesn't know about consciousness studies. Uh, we don't have a definition of consciousness. Nobody has a definition of consciousness. If you look at the dictionary, they're kind of circular, waffly things. Um, but what we do in neuroscience and philosophy and all over the place is to go back to Nagel's, what is it like to be a bat? Um, now, this is not about what's it like to have sonar and all of that, although that's why he chose bat. It's about his statement that if there is something it's like to be a bat, that's what we mean by being conscious. And if there's nothing it's like to be a bat, that's what we mean by not being conscious. So consciousness is subjectivity or what it's like. Are you conscious now? <laughs> Excellent. Were you when I asked? <laughs> so, but when you are conscious, I mean, that whole little trick there is just one of the many, many, many peculiar things about consciousness. And I'm going to throw a few at you just to make you very confused. And I hope you'll go away with a headache and go, no. Nah. Right. So what is it like to be a bat? Um, is, is our kind of a starting point. But the real problem, let's think about the real problem of consciousness. Lovely flowers, aren't they nice? Look at the flowers. Um, you're all having your own private experience of the flowers and of the colors. And some of you will be colorblind in different ways. Some, I might even have the tetrachromat here amongst the women, uh, that very rare, um, who would see colors none of the rest of us can see. Um, there's experience and there's, um, the stuff that we can measure, leading to the explanatory gap. And here's a little perplexed chap that I hope you're feeling like. Um, and uh, what the um, 19th century, um, they called the fathomless abyss <laughs> between mind and matter. So it's basically the mind body problem. But when we come to more recently um, in 1994, um, he's chopped all his hair off. Um, it's very sad. <laughs> Um, Dave Chalmers at the first ever Tucson Consciousness Conference, which is still going on, um, 
he he gave what he said was an incredibly impenetrable and difficult philosophical paper that nobody understood and nobody remembers. And before he started, he just said, and by the way, what I'm going to be talking about is not the easy problems of, you know, perception and learning and memory and how the brain works. Easy. Uh. Um, I'm going to be talking about the hard problem of consciousness. And that's become uh, very important in consciousness studies. And he defined it as the question of how physical processes in the brain give rise to subjective experience. Now, you might realize that this is problematic. If the brain is giving rise to experience, then experience is not the brain. It's a kind of dualism. And he is indeed a kind of dualist, although of such a subtle kind, I can't understand it myself. I'm not a philosopher. Um, but there are very few dualists around. He, he's one of them. But what happened was everybody wants to solve the hard problem, including Francis Crick, the discoverer of the structure of DNA. Um, and uh, he set up a whole framework for investigating it. And nobody has really got anywhere with it. Um, which is quite interesting, <laughs> because it's the wrong problem. According to illusionism, it's the wrong problem. We set the problem up because we are right from the beginning utterly deluded about our own minds. So there are lots of theories. I won't uh, go into any of them in great detail, but just to give you a gist um, of where consciousness studies is at the moment, these are some of the most popular theories. Global workspace theory, uh, Bernie Bars. Uh, is extremely popular and has been uh, for 20 years. Um, it's the idea that when any processing or anything in the brain, any processes, I guess, get into a global workspace, a kind of um, connected interspace uh, for processing, then they're conscious. Now, this can be interpreted in two completely different ways. The way Bars interprets it from his writings but he says he doesn't, but I've interviewed him in depth about this, um, and I keep coming back to what he actually writes, is there's all this stuff going on in the brain, most of it's unconscious, and then some of it gets into the global workspace, and da da <laughs> magic, it becomes conscious. The other view, which is more like Dennett's multiple drafts, which I'll mention later, is things that are in the global workspace are, sorry, I should say, Bar says once they're in there, they are then broadcast to the rest of the brain. They're conscious and they're broadcast elsewhere. The other interpretation is that the broadcast is all there is. The fact that if there is indeed, if the architecture of the brain does have a global workspace mechanism, then what happens is lots of things are going on, but those in the global workspace affect what you can say, what you can think in words for yourself, how you can wave your arms around and all the other things that go on. And that's all there is. There aren't any qualia and there aren't any conscious experiences. That's all illusion. So these are very different ways of interpreting. And of course, the first way is the popular way. The da da it's magic. Because it's very hard to understand how um, uh, it, it would work, why there would be the, this experience otherwise. There's integrated information theory which is extremely hard to understand, um, proposed by um, Christoph Koch, mainly, and others. Uh, it depends, why I say it's so difficult, it depends on very complex maths of calculating something called phi. The idea is great. It's, it's that any processing system, including brains and computers and rabbits and slugs, whatever you like, um, has both complexity or um, variety and um, integration. You need both. So um, if you have masses of stuff going on, but it's not integrated, it's not all connected together, then there won't be much consciousness. Or if you don't have much stuff, but it's all integrated, well, it's a kind of little tiny consciousness, which might be like in a fly or something. I don't know. Um, so they calculate phi, and the, more, the higher phi, the more consciousness there is in a system. And then there's um, higher order theories, which um, mainly from philosophers saying that for something to be conscious, then there has to be a higher order thought to the effect that I am conscious. I think there's some kind of sense in that because I think that's part of how the illusion comes about. But this kind of theory completely fails when it comes to pure consciousness, consciousness without a self. 
oneness in mystical experiences is that there aren't any higher order thoughts when you're... Could you just be conscious now for a moment, please? If you can do that without thinking, then it's higher order thought theories, for me, don't, don't work. Um, and very, very popular now is various kinds of panpsychism. Really tricky, and I'm glad that you mentioned it, Peter, um, because there were so many varieties of panpsychism. But And there's all sorts of problems that I won't go into, uh, but it's definitely becoming very popular. And then there's a very recent theory called um, AST, Attention Schema Theory, um, by um, Michael Graziano. Uh, you may know about the body schema. How long have I got? Good, thank you. What are you going to tell me? Will you tell me 10 minutes as well as five? Great, thank you. Um, you may know about the body schema. I'm particularly interested in this because it's enabled us to understand out-of-body experiences, which is just great. Um, the body schema is the kind of map model representation continuously updated of where your body is. So I'm concentrating on what I'm saying, although I have absolutely not concentrating on how it works and how my mouth moves or my arms and my walking about and all of that. That is all maintained by the body schema, which is connected to all the information about self and memory and control systems in the frontal lobes and so on. But the schema is a kind of model representation. And what Graziano is saying is that we have a schema of our own attentional processes. So what the system is attending to, if you think about this, if anyone knows about collective processing and active inference kind of theories, then this is a really helpful way of thinking of it because those, that predictive processing is not a theory of consciousness, it's a theory about how the brain works. And it's suggesting that in a multiple hierarchical system, at every level, the higher level is predicting what's going to come in from the lower one. So if we talk about looking at these lovely flowers, then uh, the visual system is saying that's going to stay orange, but as I move this way, it's going to go like that. And it updates its predictions all the time as it goes along. And attention then is the weighting that you're giving to m different aspects of what's going on in the system. So for Graziano, the um, consciousness is the attention schema. Now, he's, he says he's not an illusionist. But he also says, which uh, I agree with, it's all the other, I should have put others, all other theories except mine, are worse than wrong. Why are they worse than wrong? I didn't want to give you a lecture on every theory, but you can see I can throw out various arguments to all of them as to why they're wrong. Ultimately, all of them, except maybe possibly his, I'm not sure, since he's not sure. <laughs> I mean, because he's hanging on the fence there. And there's, and there's a Nick Humphrey who's recently said he's not an illusionist anymore. He, you know, uh, there's all this kind of fence sitting. Um, but um, worse than wrong, uh, I've lost my thread here. Anyone know what I, where I was going? No, never mind. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, I do know. Um, in a way, they all have these dualist undertones. And personally, I think that dualism is hopeless because you can't say how one communicates with the other if you've got two kinds of completely different stuff. Sorry, I'm not a philosopher. That's, that'll do for me, <laughs> rejecting <laughs> the, at least the more obvious forms of dualism like Cartesian dualism. Um, uh, but they kind of, it's lurking in all of them. I mean, like I said in the global workspace theory, it's kind of like pops out, consciousness pops out. Integrated information theory, well, why should this integration give rise to? Then you're back to the hard problem. And if it doesn't give rise to it, is it? Is by what experience is? Mm, I don't know. High order theory as well. I've talked about that. Panpsychism kind of gets out of the problem, but at great cost, which I won't go into. So where are we if all these theories are worse than wrong? We have to turn to illusionism. Illusionism uh, has become popular in, in 2016. Um, Journal of Consciousness Studies had a whole issue devoted to illusionism. I wrote a paper in there called The Delusions of Consciousness, which is a more sort of like 
we deluded intellectually, we kind of theorized. Well, I think Peter was talking about that in a way. We don't realize that we've got metaphysical theories going on and that we're making all these assumptions about things. Um, and that, that's, that's part of the problem. And so what illusionists like myself, Dan Dennett, Truth Franktish, many others, do is to say, this is a problem. The hard problem is not the problem. The hard problem is a statement of a dualist muddle. The real problem is the illusion problem, or what Chalmers has called the meta problem. Why we think about consciousness the way we do. Why we are so utterly confused about our own minds. Now, one confusion may be what the word illusion means, so I want to be really clear about this, because um, the, uh, Dan Dennett especially, and, and me, have so often people saying, no, you don't even believe in consciousness. What the... <laughs> I've meditated for 40 years, taken lots of psychedelics, sat here thinking, who am I? What is this? Help for endless amounts of my life. <laughs> am I just thinking and worrying about nothing? No, I'm worrying about this. Ah! You worry about it as well. Help me. So uh, we are not saying there's not a problem. We're saying that we got the problem wrong and we need to think about how we got it wrong and why. So the first thing I want to make clear is what is meant by the word illusion. An illusion is not something that doesn't exist. I got so pissed off, excuse me, I got so um, annoyed by people saying that I thought consciousness didn't exist that I went and looked up a lot of dictionaries and they all basically say the same thing, that an illusion is not what it seems to be. I mean, this movement that you can probably see uh, isn't there. I promise you that is static, but it's very clever, isn't it? Um, and this, the cafe wall illusion, named after literally a cafe wall in Bristol, um, just down from the university. Richard Gregory, one of my great heroes, long dead now, um, uh, gave it that name. Those are parallel lines, and they look parallel from here, but I bet they don't to you. Um, and that is an illusion. There's something there, but it's not what it seems to be. So that's what to hold in mind when I'm talking about illusions. I'm not saying I'm, I'm not taking, I'm not pushing things away and saying consciousness is not the way we think it is or the way it seems to be. So I would love to do loads of demonstrations. Um, I had some videos that I would show. But, uh, how many of you have seen the famous test where you see the um, students throwing balls to each other and yeah? Because uh, I would have shown that, and, and yeah, and not everyone has, and it's a most amazing experience. If you haven't tried to count the number of passes between white people, you know, get someone to show it to you, and I'm not giving the answer away. But I decided that was too complicated and time-consuming to do here. But I'll just give you a, a flavor of the kind of things that I've been interested in for a long time. Um, I hope I can demonstrate to you that something that might be surprising, that you can look at something and not see it, and you can see something that you haven't looked at. Does that sound a little surprising? Because we make a sort of, a, some people are shaking their heads, so fair enough. But I think we generally assume that we're kind of walking around the world, building up a picture, thank you, building up a picture of the world. So I look over there and I see that, and now I've still, I've still got that, and looking over here, I've got, a, really I've got a whole picture built up in, in my head. Um, but, um, it's not like that, and there is a lot to show that. So um, I just want to show you, I'm going to show you a picture. It's going to be up on the screen for two seconds, and I want you afterwards to tell me what you saw, okay? <laughs> right, what did you see? Shout out, anybody. <clears throat> Daniel Dennett, yeah. Not just Daniel Dennett, but lots of Dennett's. How many? 18. 15, someone says. Go on. 24, 18. Uh, 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 what's this? Yeah. Uh, one has what? Horns. Is that horns and, and a scar? Did anyone not see the horns and the scar? Very few. Most of you saw it. Okay. Now, why is this interesting? Well, because... For most of you, and this depends on the distance, so it might not be true for all of you, but for most of you, sorry, I better get the picture back. Um, 
you make saccades fast eye movements involuntarily all the time, about um, uh, five or six a second, typically, can be more. Um, you only had two seconds there, so you probably could only have made about 10 or 12 saccades. You would have been attracted to the horns and the scar, and you'll probably look at that for several of your saccades, whizzing around to get the details of the horns and the scar. So you cannot have looked at all the pictures. What, how does that work? It works, and the predictive processing stuff is very clearly can explain this. It works because you pick up some information. You have texture detectors, which will detect the large texture, straight lines, all the heads are in a row. That will give you the texture. Then you have pop-out detectors, which will take your attention over there. And so you get the idea of 18 identical portraits of Dan Dennett. That's what seeing is. It's not building up a picture in the brain. Now, another thing that became very important for me, I did the first ever uh, lab experiment on change blindness, and change blindness then became like a really big uh, uh, contributor to illusionism. So let's think if, now you're looking at me now, and you can see this white shirt. Imagine that this white shirt, uh, you, you shut your eyes like that and open them again, and when you open them, it's blue. Would you notice? Please shout. A few no's and, uh, and mostly yeses. Uh, what if um, if you blinked and when you when the blink was over, it had changed? Would you notice? That, yeah, the change happens at the same time, exactly the same time as the blink. Would you notice? Or if you just moved your eyes? Well, this was a um, suggestion that Dan Dennett made in his 1991 book, Consciousness Explained. Um, and I did an experiment to find out. And, Lots of people have done more since. But this is a very simple demonstration here. Um, I want you to look at this picture, and I'm going to change the picture. And I don't want you to shout out. All I'm doing is moving the picture as though you were moving your eyes. So you move your eyes all the time, and you think you would notice changes. Um, hands up if you can't see what's changing. Oh, lots of you. I better keep going then. Oh, God, what's happened? What's happened? There we go. Hands up if you still can't see the... God! I mean, I would go on, but how long have I got? <laughs> oh dear, I've only got five minutes. I better get on with it then. Okay, uh, uh, ha who has seen the change? It's pretty obvious, isn't it? <laughs> now I'll show you it. <coughs> so, you just then notice, and there have been amazing experiments done in real life as well as in the lab. I mean, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, it's pretty obvious. Actually, this was done before Photoshop, and that's me like 30 years ago. <laughs> um, and I do it in a more sense. Well, you can just see I'm moving as well, which is kind of weird. Anyway, enough of that. Are you conscious now? Yeah. <laughs> Same experience of you bet you weren't conscious in the way you are now throughout. You were concentrating on, on what was going on. And who is conscious? Uh, it gets worse. And I've only got nine more, eight minutes, so I better get on with it. Oh. No! All right. Dan, Dan Dennett. Lovely guy. Uh, he's really not the devil. He was called the devil by um, uh, Burton Forhees in a peer-reviewed uh, article in the Journal of Consciousness Studies. So that's official. He's the devil, hence the horns and everything. Um, the multiple draft theory is so tricky, people keep getting it wrong because it undermines all our illusions. Basically, he's saying the brain is just full of multiple drafts of all kinds of information in parallel, masses and masses and masses of stuff going on all over the place. None of it is conscious or unconscious. There's no fact of the matter about uh, is this process conscious or, or this not. Actually, there's no fact of the matter about whether I'm conscious or not, other than that I, after the fact, attribute myself to having been conscious. It's all after the fact attributions. That's kind of creepy, isn't it? No wonder people don't understand it. It's very, very tricky. But asking this question, does the world feel a bit like this to you? I'm inside my head. Obviously, you don't have a television in your head. I'm inside my head. There's a picture in my head that I'm looking at. I've got the lever to control with my free will. 
doesn't exist, of course, but never mind. Um, and uh, there I am. This is what Dennett calls uh, the Cartesian theater. Obviously, Descartes didn't say it, but it's, it's, it's kind of sneaking Cartesian dualism into our, the way we interpret the world. And he says, when you discard Cartesian dualism, you must discard the show that would have gone on in the Cartesian theater. That's the pictures in the brain head and the audience as well, because you can't find them in the brain and the brain's the only way, place to look for them, he says. So how do we discard the, let me just put that back, discard the show that would have gone on in the theater and the audience. How do we discard them? Well, one method, is meditation. I've been training in Zen for 40 years, <laughs> meditating every day for nearly that long. Uh, it's a very slow process, and I'm a very slow learner. Um, but uh, some progress, I would say, in that this room feels like there's not me separate from the room. There's this stuff going on after a lot of this. And of course, the, uh, the psychedelics. And very often, Psychedelic experiences, as you all know, really affect the sense of self. I'm particularly interested in DMT, and I was so thrilled to read that paper recently that shows that DMT disrupts the major um, networks in the brain, and especially the um, default mode network, which is intrinsic to the self and is heavily linked to the body schema, um, and that is disrupted. No wonder these experiences seem to be experienced without me experiencing, or else I become everything and it's a different way of saying the same thing, or perhaps it's a different feeling. Um, so that's, um, that's very exciting. And those of you who were at the first lecture in the other place will know more than I do about research on DMT, but I look forward to finding out more about it. But this leads me to a big question. I hope that I have demonstrated a just a little tiny bit, how the way we think about our own minds is wrong, how much work we need to do to dismantle the illusions. And I'm proposing here that both meditation and psychedelics can, not necessarily, but can help us to see through the illusions. But I'm very much left with this question. Do psychedelic experiences thrust us into Reality, and no, I wouldn't like to put it that way. Do they propel us through the illusions? Do they help us see through the illusions so that actually we can let go of all that idea that I'm inside here uh, looking at the outside world, uh, I'm in control, I've got free will, it's, it's up to me to decide what I do. I and mean, all these kinds of illusions, time, which disappears in so many of these experiences and certainly in deep meditation, shifts dramatically and all goes away completely, there's no now. When I say, are you conscious now? You're making a now as well, um, and, and putting yourself into it. Or does it, it, or do they just replace old illusions with new ones? And to some extent, uh, we, what you said, Peter, was really helpful about this, and the same sort of thoughts that I would have about this. Um, you know, is there actually an experience and we all describe it differently or is it really different experiences? I don't know. But I do think <clears throat> from what I've told you so far, if, if, if the way that consciousness, be, uh, uh, the way we become deluded about consciousness is constantly retrospectively saying, oh, of course I was conscious then. And the only time we really is like, oh, it's now, I'm conscious now. And then we forget oh, it's constant attributions after the fact then we're doing the same thing with psychedelics, with trips afterwards, or even at the time, but retrospectively to a moment ago, telling stories based on the metaphysics. I wouldn't have used that word before today. Um, based on the metaphysics that we're already immersed in and have not sufficiently looked at, then I think we can just have more illusions. Um, we can, some people will say that they saw angels or they found their own angel, guardian angel, or they'll, they'll say that they had an out of the body experience and that their soul went somewhere else. And we know very well now how out of body experiences work in the brain and how they're not, <laughs> nothing leaves the body. Or they're absolutely convinced of personal life after death, not some like just going as a drop into the ocean, uh, um, or into, uh, 
timelessness, but actually me going on living somewhere else or being reincarnated or whatever. These often come up. And um, the evidence of near-death experiences, which I've written a lot about um, and had myself, um, again, we have the good explanations now. So I think the answer, maybe it's a cop-out, but that's my answer. And perhaps I should really have replaced it with an enormous question mark and say, I don't know. Thank you.